We live in the time of Joe Burrow, he says. This is Joe Burrow's conference, he says. This is Joe hey. Burrow's league. Dumbass. Well, no, what no, a dumbass. Just, that, no, no, there's some, there's some other stuff you said was some dumbass stuff, like Brock Purdy is Bro uh, Tom Brady. We'll get to that. I but no, man. Tom Brady. I didn't say that. That's how, that's how rumors get started. <laughs> Michael has said that this is magic and bird uh, between Burrow and Mahomes, which suggests that they go back and forth. Do you agree with that? Because I want to point out, if I if I gave you my top three quarterbacks, they're all in the AFC. Mahomes is on the list, Burrow's on the list, and so is yep. Josh Allen. Yep. Have we too quickly moved on from maybe it's maybe it's Bird, Magic, and, 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 and one more player. And Isaiah. And Isaiah. You know what I mean? Shout what, out to Detroit. More. Charles, come on, where you yeah, at, Charles? Yeah. Okay. They walk and, and, in the and, and we're room. looking. And they're cameras. He said they're what cameras. everybody else was probably thinking. They walk okay, in the room. Okay, let everybody else think it. How about this, Mike? Can I say this? Say everybody else is thinking it. But why don't you just shut up? So the 49ers are a team. They're one of those teams that gets to the game, gets to the conference championship. And you know what? In 20 years, They'll have a reunion over over getting to three championships in Damn, four years. Damn, you are a hater. You are no, bitter. No, oh, oh, I am. Oh, I am. Oh, you I are am. bitter. Because I just, like you just, I, you just I hate. I really hate the way yeah, this you team stop is right there. You hate. You can just yeah. stop right there. I know. I hate. I hate. Dot dot dot. Dot dot dot. If I knew what I was gonna fucking do, I'd have already fucking done it. Okay, I'm taking it a day at a time. I said you're antagonized by the question. <laughs> People right now are like, Tom Brady, your slip is showing? No. He was like, Michael Holly, I got a little message. I'm going to send it through Jim Gray. Jim Gray <laughs> took a stray. I turned down the Jackson State job to come here, Roland Martin. Jackson State called Brown called me. Deion Sanders called me himself, man. He lacks the temperament, the discipline, the focus and the communication skills, Bethune Cookman had every right and reason to fire Ed Reed. With the Eagles, tell me somebody who is impactful but is not getting the credit from the national media where you all know locally, oh man, they're missing it. That's easy. Hassan Reddick. The, the Kyle Shanahan love is out of control. The Brock Purdy <laughs> thing is out of control. And I'm so against it. I don't want to deal with the 49ers and the Shanahan sycophants in the Super Bowl. Were you like hey, this in 2001 when Bill Belichick and Tom Brady was doing this? Well, uh -oh. they weren't getting that uh -oh. love either. Uh -oh. they, no, they, no, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was making money off of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were. Thank you. All right, welcome back to Brother from Another. Uh, you see the headlines there. Lots of tributes, uh, lots of commentary about Tyree Nichols, 29-year-old young man, brutally uh, beaten, ultimately killed by Memphis police officers. And I intentionally didn't give you the name, uh, the number of, of those uh, Memphis police officers involved because the number continues to grow. So we start off with five. Then remember on yesterday's show, we mentioned there was a sixth. And then after yesterday's show, there was a seventh officer mentioned. And then there are, are, are people from the EMTs, uh, fire department, who have lost their jobs. People in the sheriff's department who have lost their jobs. This continues to grow. And so, the, the tragedy, I mean, the tragedy is that uh, Tyree Nichols is not here. And what makes this story even more tragic uh, and even deeper than we realize is that it's continuing, it's continuing to sprawl the people involved. And I know just instincts. Don't you know this? Some certain things you just know that you know that you know, and the data is not, hasn't arrived yet to confirm what you already know. But the level of involvement, I just know it, the level of involvement goes deep and it's deeper than we realize and it's deeper than ha has been reported. But uh, 
I believe in journalists and I believe in great journalism. And so I believe that story will come out soon. I can tell you this uh, family discussion. I always keep it real with you. Keep it 100. Keep it 200 with you on brother from another that person. I teased before the break. Hey, we're going to hear from her. Uh, that was the one and only Joy Ann Reed from the readout on MSNBC. Uh, unfortunately, having some technical difficulties, could not connect uh, with Joy Reed. We'll maybe uh, get to chat with her another time. So Joy Reed will not be on the show today. We do have a couple other people you want to hear from. And I want to address this. So Joy is not here. And I wanted to begin our segment with her. Uh, with this clip with the one and only Brittany Packnett Cunningham. Uh, Brittany said this on, on Joy's show. I want you to take a listen and I'll have something to say on the other side. Check this out. What is it that the community, when you talk to folks, what do they want? So I want to back up for a second, Joy, because I feel myself getting hot, if I'm honest. And respectfully to the other guests, I heard the word control quite a bit. And therein lies the problem. Because if we're talking about the ways to properly control a black body, we're not actually identifying the fact that the problem is that you want to control the black body in the first place. This is not about safety. This is not about public safety. That's not about serving and protecting. We're talking about a traffic stop. So the idea that there is a proper way to control a 150 pound person who is now dead is actually deeply offensive to me. The fact of the matter is people want safety. People want us to invest our money in the things that truly keep us safe. And I'm sorry, if we keep talking about training, millions, billions of dollars have been poured into training. And I say this as someone who used to advocate for these things. But I'm reminded of James Baldwin in this moment. How long do you want us to wait for your progress? Gentlemen, how long do you want us to wait for your progress? You are telling me that more training is the answer. There's been more training. There have been body cameras. There's been uh, recruitment. There's been additional diversity. There's been money and resources poured into all of these things instead of the things that we criminalize people for, like substance abuse, like mental health, like houselessness. How long do you want us to wait for your progress? Because right now, this is certainly not what the people want. And we're tired of continuously being told to wait in order to in order to achieve and experience the kind of personal safety and respect and dignity that we deserve. Oh, powerful words, powerful words from Brittany Packnett Cunningham on the readout. And and I think you know, you, you feel her passion and you listen to her commentary, uh, Sterling as usual on point as usual. And there's something she said there that that kind of puts us all together in this pool at when we have this conversation. And that is, you know, people want they want safety. Yes, we all agree on that, right? Uh, people want safety. They want respect. They want dignity and they don't want to be told to wait. You know, if I look back, if I look back at some of my own, my, my personal writing, you know, back in the day, I can tell you about this later, but back in the day, I used to write a little poetry. But if I look back at my personal writing, I've been mentioning some of these things since I was 23, 24 years old. I mean, I have a poem. I have a poem that, that where, where Malise Green is mentioned in Detroit. That was in, in, in the 1990s, early 1990s. I have a poem about Amadou Diallo, right, 1999, 2000 in New York. And so you're going back. Okay, that's that's over 20 years. We're talking about the same things. And so I understand what Brittany is saying, She's saying, hey, how long are we supposed to wait? How long are we supposed to wait for your progress? I think the the, the conversation that we're all having and and respectfully, we don't all have the same ideas about how to get through these problems or, or or to how to resolve them. There are a lot of people who want the whole thing, just want to tear it all down. Want to tear it down and, and, and start over. There are some people who still believe that there is some measure of reform that can happen. And there are some who look at that and say, you're out of your mind. Uh, you can't have reform, especially if you're going to have law enforcement be the reformers. I had, had an interesting conversation uh, with a police officer, a, a white police officer, about uh, about three weeks ago. 
and he told me about his area. I'm not going to uh, tell you the city, but he, he said a lot of people in his city right now don't want to be police officers because they can't win. They can't win. Nobody wants to see them coming. Even when they come uh, with respect and dignity and um, true policing, you know, the, the, you know, honorable policing, professional policing, you know, nonviolent policing, nobody wants to see them coming. And whenever they, they, whenever they arrive, they get resistance no matter what. And he said he's been seeing a, a therapist and he wants out. He said a lot of people are leaving because they can't handle it. They can't handle the way people look at them. So, I mean, it's, it's a, a from, from where I sit and, and you feel free to disagree. And I know we'll have some uh, panelists who will talk about this and, and give their perspectives from where I sit. There is no easy solution of, Hey, if you do this one thing, or if you do these three or four things, we're going to have a different <laughs> utopian society. I'm not, uh, I, I don't see that coming. Maybe somebody else does. I don't see that, but that, that's why we're here today. Uh, we're going to have this conversation. We got two great panelists coming up. Sorry. We had to switch the schedule around a little bit. Technical difficulties happen. It's the way of the world, especially in 2023. Although that's a, that's a very 2020 problem. We have some Wi-Fi issues. That's 2020. That shouldn't be 23. Well, we'll get back on track right after this. Do you know like how much force it takes to beat somebody with your bare hands? How much violence that takes? How much anger that takes? How much hate that has to take? This system is not working. And matter of fact, let me take it back. It is working. It's working exactly the way that it's intended to be. I think we need to break the system, shut it the f down, and reimagine what it's like for our communities to actually be safe. Police pulling us over in unmarked cars, wearing street clothing, that's not them trying to keep us safe. That's them targeting us. That is them specifically seeking us out. That is them specifically trying to criminalize us. The issue is criminalization and incarceration. And until we can get legislators in office that's going to do more than do photo ops and kneel on Kente cloths like they did something, then we're going to keep being in the streets and people are going to keep dying and black people are going to continue to be hashtag. All right, welcome back to the show. As I told you, there are a lot of thoughts, a lot of uh, uh, commentary about where we go from here. And I, I can't have this conversation by myself. We've got to bring in some folks who really know what they're talking about. Let's talk. Uh, let's bring in uh, to brother from another, both making their brother from another debut, both of them. And uh, I hope it's the first that not just the first, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Not the last time. You know what I'm trying to say? I, I want you to come back many, many, many times. Uh, we have Ole O'Loren. Uh, she's a movement lawyer. I love that a movement lawyer and a political commentator. And we have Sam Sinyangwe, who is uh, a data scientist and, and, and co-founder or founder of mapping police violence. So welcome to the show. And you heard that, and this is a great place to start, uh, Sam and Ole, that I said right before you came on, you could get, you know, 25 people together, 25 conscious, righteous people, and you're going to have a number of opinions about where do we go from here after seeing yet another death at the hands of the state. In this case, uh, a 29 year old man uh, who had his life taken away by multiple. I'm not going to say five because it maybe was more than that by multiple police officers in, in Memphis. So Ole, uh, first question, I'll make it open ended. Where do we go from here? Honestly, I want to say that everything that we're going to say has been said before. That's the unfortunate reality of this, right? They killed 1,192 people last year. This is a, a constant thing. These are not new problems. These are not new pains. And it's important for America to recognize that justice is not what you do after someone has been killed by the police. It's what you do to prevent it. And they always create this conversation about reform, and they make it seem as though advocates, the Black community, is against reform. But it's not us who's against reform. It's not us who's saying that the system can't be reformed. 
it's them. We're the ones saying, hey, police are killing us. These things need to change. And they're the ones who are telling us it's okay. We constantly have this fight where we watch we watch murders happen on video. And then we have to convince this country. We have to beg and plead for a few officers to be charged with murders we saw them commit. And they defend it. And they fight it. And the police unions come out and tell us it's okay. The legislators come out and tell us it's okay. They come out and defend it. So it's not us saying that the system is working as intended. It's them. And we don't have a problem with reform efforts that actually prevent people from being killed that take power away from the state but they don't want to do that they offer us you know placating initiatives like body cameras and body camera footage and these kinds of initiatives are completely the antithesis of what america is or who america is because let's be honest this idea that oh america will change or america will be moved to be sympathetic if they if they see black people being killed on video how many black people do we need to be killed on video before we understand that America is not sympathetic to that? This is a country whose history used to have lynchings and make it a sport. They watch lynchings as a family. They did postcards. So we're not being honest with ourselves about who the country is. If we keep saying that sympathy out of the goodness of their hearts, it's going to change. So where do we go from here? I mean, America has to tell us, because we've said what needs to happen. We say our community should not be lined with police officers. We talk about what needs to happen. You know, they'll, they'll talk about George Floyd and they'll be so moved and so sympathetic about what happens to George Floyd, but they never talk about why the police were in that neighborhood, why they were called in the first place. They don't actually talk about, hey, maybe we should not have armed police officers conducting traffic stops. They never actually talk about the initiatives that prevent it. Instead, they talk about giving police more funding. They talk about giving police more training. And I say this, police have more in the U.S. We give more money to policing than anything else. There's nothing we give and put more money into than we do mass incarceration and policing and training. So what is the magical number that is going to prevent these deaths and everything from occurring? Why is it always keep giving more resources to the same people that are brutalizing a community rather than those communities themselves? I've never in my life heard someone say, hey, someone is there to serve somebody that has less, right? Well, that makes no sense. Why do the, the people that are charged to allegedly protect you have more than you have? And we also have to talk about the fact that the safest communities are not the communities that are most policed. They're the ones that are most resourced. And we have to actually talk about moving power away from the state. It's not enough to say, oh, we're going to pass reform initiatives. But that reform initiatives is to keep giving more money to your killers, to keep upholding qualified immunity and all these things to prevent them from being accountable. Where do we go from here is how do we actually prevent it. It is not enough for them to say justice is the words that they use, that they're sympathetic. Oh, this is so sad that they give settlements. You cannot bring those people back. There's no justice that you can give to the family of Tyree Nichols. There's no justice that you can give to his four-year-old son that's left without his father. There is no justice for that. So we actually have to stop it, but that's the conversation that they don't really want to have. No, nah, just, I mean, honestly, building on this point, uh, as Ole said, there are nearly 1,200 people killed by police last year we were able to document. Um, that is at an at, at all-time high, at least over the past decade, which is as far back as we even have reliable data on people killed by police, because the federal government still to this day will not collect reliable and comprehensive data on people who are killed by police, let alone all of the other forms of police violence um, that occur much more frequently in communities. Now, what do we do about it? Where do we go from here? Um, well, first, when we look at the data, you know, 2022 was not an outlier when it comes to the types of circumstances in which people were killed by the police. There were more people killed, but the circumstances remained largely the same. It's people being killed after routine traffic stops, people being killed after mental health calls, people being killed for a whole range of low-level, nonviolent issues that armed police officers are being called into where ultimately people end up being killed. And so, you know, in order to change that dynamic, we have to remove the police from those situations. We have to create real um, and at scale alternatives, um, not just to mental health calls, which are already starting up in some cities. You have in Denver with the STAR program, you have in San Francisco now, the majority of mental health calls are being responded to uh, by uh, mental health clinicians through their program. So there are some programs that are starting in a handful of cities around that issue. But when it comes to traffic enforcement, the majority of police contacts across the country are traffic stops. Um, about 100 people are killed every year after a routine traffic stop for a traffic violation and nothing else. So, you know, we have to remove the police from traffic enforcement. Cre when you go to other places, other countries, for example, they don't have the police, physical police, pulling people over with guns for driving over the speed limit or having an expired tag or having a broken taillight. That doesn't happen. In the United States, it happens and people are being killed over it. So, again, 
again, like there are solutions to each one of these types of situations. It involves not sending a police officer, sending in a real alternative that is somebody who is trained to deal with those situations that's not a police officer, that is not armed. Um, and we're already seeing those approaches um, already working in some cities that are beginning to scale them up. The problem is there are 18,000 different police jurisdictions. Very few of them have any real alternatives. And in the meantime, police are continuing to step up the violence, um, continue to respond more aggressively to these types of situations year over year, and people are losing their lives. Yeah. You know, and, and I want you I want you both to uh, continue on this. This is great. Uh, and, and Sam, stay right there because I want to bring up something. I, I saw you uh, speak about six years ago. Uh, you gave a talk. You were talking about taking away some of these narratives, some of these false narratives, countering them with data and and offering, uh, you know, uh, you had a 10 point, you know, a 10 point solution. Sorry, you know, like 10, 10 steps, 10 steps that we can take. So what's What's more difficult? <laughs> is it more difficult to kind of disabuse people of these narratives that they have in their heads that are not factually based? Or is it more of a challenge to get people, as Ole said, who, have, who are hoarding power and a, a bit of self-preservation? Hey, this, this system benefits me. <laughs> I'm not trying to give this up. Is it more difficult to get people to, get people to take these solutions and give up their power or is it harder to get people these these uh, antiquated notions out of their heads about what true policing is so i mean both are necessary i think that we can't get to the solutions conversation until we disabuse people of some of these narratives that they use in place of even acknowledging a problem exists, right? So there are these narratives that the police have been pushing for decades, even centuries, about a narrative that goes something like this, that the police are killing people, particularly black people, because they're encountering violent people in communities with high rates of crime, and they're needing to protect themselves and others uh, from harm. That's like the narrative the police use. Every single time they kill somebody, they put out some press release that basically follows that narrative. Then we learn when, when the video comes out, that in fact, it was a very different situation. We learn when we look at the actual data, when we unpack the data, that in fact, uh, only about one in every three cases in which somebody's killed by police began with a case where it was a reported or alleged, not convicted, alleged violent crime. One in three. We're two thirds of cases in which people are killed by police every single year. We're talking about these low level nonviolent offenses, which the police respond to. In some cases, no crime at all. The police just find somebody, decide to harass them for no apparent reason. And ultimately people are being killed over these routine low level stops. So again, that's, that's what's going on when we look at the real data. It's not the police narrative of constantly being in danger, constantly being um, you know, at risk of violence from the community. That's not the, the, the life that the police are currently leading. The police are in, 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 in environments where they are heavily armed, heavily protected um, with militarized equipment um, in communities that are not protected from the police um, and are engaged in harassing and stopping and abusing people for low level nonviolent issues that the police escalate with violence and even deadly force. Yeah. We have to transform. Honestly, what we have to do is we have to transform what people believe justice is, what we believe, what people believe is happening in the criminal system and what we what people believe the police do. Because, first of all, nationwide, over 80 percent of arrests, all over 80 percent of all arrests are for misdemeanors, traffic offenses or um, um, non nonviolent crime. They're not felonies. They're not these violent crimes. It's not what it's being sensationalized to mean in our media. And so people have this idea that people who find themselves in the criminal system, people who are having incidents with uh, police officers are bad people they're doing particularly bad things and that's not the truth the overwhelming majority of people that are incarcerated in america are people who made less than twelve thousand dollars annually prior to arrest it's poor people that's what you're actually seeing in the system not this and then i think more importantly people need to stop thinking of justice as when the police come about when when police come about and they arrest people or they incarcerate people out police respond to scenarios like if we take an example of the reality is lapd we're in the first month of 2023 lapd killed three men back to back all having mental health crises within a 24 hour span and if you look at takara smith takara smith's own wife walked to lapd she walked into the police station and said my husband is having a mental health crisis and handed them a number to a mental health professional and asked them to call what did they do 15 minutes later they come to her home and they shoot and kill her husband that is not that is not help 
that is not justice and and it was important to remember that they'll say they'll justify these things after the fact by vilifying the victim they'll say they were in danger this person posed a threat to them but there's no world in which we as civilians if his wife had killed him if anybody else had killed him in response to his mental health crisis they would be arrested they would be incarcerated they would be charged but somehow it's okay for police the people that are supposed to allegedly help to come in and kill people and that is a routine thing three people back to back and the problem is in a country where we are literally not being hyperbolic police kill more than one person every single day you can't even catch up to the lives lost right we're talking about tyree nichols and that already has drowned out keenan anderson and keenan anderson is already drowned out to car smith we can't even keep up with the deaths and then people will translate justice i saw somebody online today said well not to be insensitive but justice has already been served about tyree nichols and i'm like justice to you is charging these officers or that you know their identity they're not nobody's not that a conviction would, would constitute justice because like i said there is no justice when he's dead his family has to mourn him but if you look at that and you think oh because you know the five black officers that killed tyree nichols that's justice meanwhile you still don't know the identity of the eight officers that shot jalen walker 60 times in ohio right, right. you see right Absolutely. And I'll tell you this, uh, Sam, I'm going to um, let me brag on Ole here for a second. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I have to brag on this this prophecy. I mean, it's not a great thing, but it is a great thing. It just tells you where her mind is. She wrote in the summer. Okay, over the summer 2022 uh, talking about black people who are speaking against the interests of the black community and really breaking it down of Hey, you're being allowed to speak not because these people like you, but they have tokenized you. They're using you as a tool, right? Yeah, but here's the line. Here's the line. So you are a tool and should you cease to be useful, you will be discarded. That's why white police officers kill black people every day and avoid charges even when thousands of people march and demand them. But black police officers who do the same find themselves quickly fired and prosecuted Ole, you wrote that over the summer. What do we have in the winter of 2023? Could you help people out for those who still don't understand what you're trying to say? Could you help people out about like the dynamics of this, depending on the race of the police officer? The reality is white supremacy does not need a white person in the room to function in a country or white, where white supremacy is ingrained in your institutions. And that's what people need mm. to understand about systemic racism. Mm. You could diversify the police department all you want. You can diversify the people who brutalize you and kill you. It changes nothing to do with the problem because often, and this is a reality we know across our community, you could quote James Baldwin or you could quote NWA. We are long aware of the reality of the black policemen because they are working overtime to prove their solidarity with that badge. And the thing is this, if you as a black person, we all know you have an option to go and legitimize white supremacist talking points. You always have that option. They will they will always welcome you. You are always welcome. Black police officers are welcome to join the police departments. You are welcome to be agents of white supremacy. But the moment it is not to their benefit, they will not protect you the way that they protect their own. And that's what we're seeing here. People are, people think when I highlight, you know, how the black police officers, they're making their, you know, they're making them the face of police brutality. They're doing that on purpose. I knew before we saw the video, the moment they the uh, the fact three days after this beating they charged they arrested these um ar uh, fired these officers and they charged them and they came out and told us how brutal it is it's the most brutal video we've ever seen I knew why they were doing that because they uh, painting them as brutal as br the brutality aligns with the narrative they've always had about black men as brutes right they it's a reason why they're not talking about this as police brutality but instead they're calling it black on black crime is a reason why they're painting them as thugs rather than talking about them as policemen because it allows them to make us the face of brutality while not recognizing any overarching problems in policing and that's not to say that's not to say oh these officers should be being treated better i have no sympathy for them i have no sympathy for them i wish to make an example out of them in the same way that the police departments and our legislators and white supremacists want to make an example of them but for different reasons it's to show you hey you're welcome to do this you can do this you can mistreat your community you can brutalize us the same way but you will not be protected in the end and that's what you're witnessing and this isn't new that's important to remember i have a thread on twitter of over hundreds of deaths hundreds of people have been killed by police and everywhere on that thread that i have a black police officer that killed them they're charged every single time and that is something that's important wow. to remember yeah, uh, Sam and, and Sam uh, and and Ole, please, uh, you know, before we get out of here, look, we got a, the education starts step by step. How can you know, how can some folks kind of get to your levels, 
get to your levels. You guys are the, are the class leaders. Okay. Uh, the, the straight, the straight a plus students in this conversation. So how can we get to your levels? Where do we start? Where do we start just to kind of educate ourselves about where we are? I'm not saying that there are any solutions, any quick solutions here to fix it, but how do we start educating ourselves and, and getting uh, more informed about the problems that we're facing today? Sam, so I mean, there are a couple of things that we could do. One, my approach is to look at the data. Like I'm a data-driven person. Um, if that is your approach, like go to mappingpoliceviolence.us, go to policescorecard.org, two websites uh, that house a lot of data that we've collected around police use of force and police shootings, um, deaths by police, et cetera. Um, so all of that is broken down to help people understand like why does this keep happening again and again? Who is being impacted? Um, what are some of the approaches that different cities or even states are taking to address it and why might those approaches not be working i think like beyond that once you get that data look at your particular city or state because so much of this is decentralized there are 18,000 different police jurisdictions it might be that in your particular city there is an issue that even in the data is a clear and outlying issue that might not be as much of an issue in another city um, but you can use the data to help identify those issues and bring those to elected leaders policymakers, or ultimately replace those people if they're not trying to listen but ultimately get some far-reaching transformative changes adopted that remove the police from as many of these functions as possible, that take the funding from those functions, invest them in real alternatives, and start researching those alternatives as well. I mentioned Denver, the STAR program. San Francisco has a mental health first response program that's really at scale now, and we're getting to scale. And take a look at some of those programs online and what they're doing and see if you can get one of those in your cities. I think political education, you know, I think people think as an attorney, you think you're doing God's work, but I think the honest truth is education and learning more and about the reality and unlearning a lot of what we've been taught and indoctrinated to believe about our society is what really makes the change. Like my college professor handed me our prisons obsolete. And even to someone who knew the criminal system was racist, that was the first time I heard that I'm like, abolish, abolish the criminal systems because you're taught your race to think of these man-made systems, prisons, mass incarceration, policing. That's all you've ever known. So you think of it like water and air, rather than things that don't have to be there, things that are policy choices. And that was the beginning of a long journey for me. So I think the first thing you have to recognize, um, the first thing you need to do is start educating yourself, recognize the police's interest groups uh, and, and the biases and the way that you're fed propaganda. I think the second thing is to realize that nobody gives up their entire foundation the way that the first time it's challenged. That's just not true. People tend to approach this work in educating themselves and others. Like, what's the one thing, I get this question a lot, what's the one thing you could tell somebody to, you know, shut them up nothing there's there is nothing you know it's a process Even, I, I, there, there's a process i couldn't tell you today i you know i became an abolitionist or when was the moment there was no one particular thing it's an accumulation of information so i would say i started with our prisons obsolete by angela davis i would read i would look at you know becoming abolitionist by derica Purnell. i would look at end end of policing by alex vitale i would look at you know we do it till we free us by mariam k but i would follow people like me follow people like sam and um really start to learn but give yourself the grace and start scrutinizing what you're being fed ask yourself all the incidents you see of police lies look at uvalde and tell yourself should we be treating police police narratives as the facts should that be is that objective reporting is there something we should push back on and that's why i say political education because change that's how we shift social consciousness at the end of the day there's a reason why in the wake of these things are connected you know in the wake of 2020 people will talk about you know, how they have more legislation, you know, to increase police funding. But what they don't talk about in, in connection to that is how much effort you see to prevent certain books, history. It's not a coincidence that on the on the rise of the largest social justice movement they've seen in the country, they've now done their endeavor best to keep all these materials, all these people out of your spaces because they recognize that people support this. Americans are complicit with this because that's what they've indoctrinated, they've been indoctrinated to believe in. And the average person in this country lives check to check. They do not have the time to be me or Sam and be engaged just on a day-to-day -day basis. So they trust their legislators and their journalists to tell them things. So when they actually start getting educated and learn, unlearn these things, they stop supporting it. So that's why you see Republicans in so much effort to keep people from ever hearing the information at all. So I cannot emphasize enough to me, education is really how we, how we move forward. Because I could have easily been, I tell people, it's real nice when I'm an advocate for for the right thing, but I could be just this dogmatic for the wrong thing had I not been educated <laughs> and you know uh, opened up to certain, you can imagine this level of intensity on the other side, it would be a problem. <laughs> so I say education, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Hey, listen, uh, Ole and Sam, uh, you have uh, started the education process for us today. We appreciate it. Please come back. That's what I was trying to say in the beginning. Please come back. Yes. 
You always have uh, you always have a place here. Don't even worry about it. Just come on through. You don't have to knock. Just come Thank through. You. We got a spot for you. Appreciate you both. Thanks so much. Bye, y'all. It's a reaction that anybody have a competitor. You know, you know what what was in state. You know, the time and moment. You know, I mean, I love this game. No doubt in my mind. They, they talking about my character as a teammate. You know, some people don't never play this game. They don't know how much effort guys put in the game. You know, a guy make a mistake over and done with. I was emotional. I was in the moment. I was wrong. I would say I was wrong. As a man, you can look at yourself in, in the mirror and say I was wrong. I wasn't a great teammate at that moment. But they don't define me as a man, you know. But it is what it is, 24 hours. I'm going back to work. I got a great off season ahead with my kids and family. That's all that matters at the end of the day. When I go home to my kids, they love me. When I go home to my fiance, they love me. That's all that matters. So all the other stuff is relevant. Back to work. All right, hey, look, all right, so that, that's Jermaine Pratt and, and uh, Mike Jones. For those who don't know, you were in Kansas City. So for those who don't know, uh, Jermaine Pratt and the Bengals leaving the field in Kansas City, going through the tunnel where media members are, cameras are, and Pratt is just, you know, can't help himself, just kind of right. spews out, spews out at Osai. Young second-year second player, you know, got to keep your hands off the quarterback. He's yelling at him. And I would say, Mike, look, he said he was wrong. But I, does he really believe it? Because that's not how you do an apology. Like, like okay, apology is an apology is I was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. We don't need all the other kind, all the other stuff. Leave all the other stuff out there. Hey, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going home. I got kids. My wife. Hey, we ain't talking about your fiance. We ain't talking about your kids. You were wrong. Just say that. Stop playing. Hey, I'm a great guy. I no. Just say you were wrong. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, where, where did you stand? Where did you stand on Pratt, and where did you stand on the end of the game uh, in Bengals Chiefs? I, I mean, I understood his frustrations, um, but you know, you want to, you know, oh, shake a young fella and, and and you know, and make sure he understands how costly his mistake was. But at the same time, that wasn't the only thing uh, that cost them that game. Um, that let down. I mean, Patrick Mahomes had picked up the first down uh, with his scramble. Uh, so, hey, it was a great, great performance by Patrick Mahomes. Um, it was a good performance by the Bengals, just not quite good enough. Um, great performance by the Kansas City defense because without them forcing them to punt, um, you know, I really thought when they got the ball back that I said to my colleague, I said, oh, so they're going to lose by three again. Uh, but the defense held and they got the ball back. And so it wasn't just um you know the the late hit that cost them the chance to go to the super bowl yeah and and i, I think we agree mike that it was a late hit there's no controversy there not from where i sit uh he was clearly out of bounds you saw mike hilton kind of hold up okay he's out of bounds next play there here comes osai i feel i feel for him but it was the right call yeah. you agree you know no definitely it was the right call look there were a lot of people whining about a lot of calls late in the game um, but when you look at each one of them, they were the right calls that were made. Were the refs a little more ticky tack at times? Um, yes. Were there calls that were missed? Yes. But there's missed holding calls on every single play um, in almost yeah. every single game. Uh, but hey, um, that was a call that they really did have to make. Look, he's he's well out of bounds. You know, everybody else, like you said, yeah. is holding up. So you know. You know, I, I tell you, one of my least favorite calls of the game. Uh, and 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 forgive me, this is off the dome, but it was a late. Let, let's put it this way: it was the last pass interference call on Mike Hilton, which I thought was a joke. That was a ter that was a terrible call. Uh, do you remember this one? I think it may have been on third down. I think it was a third down pass interference call, where you know it's just like some contact between the receiver and Hilton, and they called Hilton for pass yeah. interference. I, I thought, yeah, I thought it was terrible. That that one was, that one was kind of bad. Although if you're following the letter of the law very strictly, then it was right. You know the Eli Apple one was even worse. That was the whole. Um, you know. Uh, so again, there were there was a lot of them, and and there were you know there was one that the Bengals. Oh, Apple, right, I, that I, maybe you're right. You're right. My bad. Yeah. My bad. You're he right. Definitely it had, Apple. It was he definitely had a hold of. It was Apple. Yeah. He yeah. had a hold of his jersey there. Um. So you know, he, he deserved it. The Bengals could argue that Joe Burrow should have received a late hit call or a roughing the passer call 
um, you know, that he did not. Um, so again, there is all kinds of calls that were made. It's happening in real time. There is stuff when I'm there in person and I don't see, and I see people on Twitter talking about because they see all the replays. So it's a it's a tough job. Um, obviously, they got to do better. Um, and the NFL has got to continue to try to find ways to improve the integrity. Uh, but the referees were indeed, you know, doing their best they could. All right. So you, when you think, yeah, they're doing the best they could, but their reason they can't do better is because they're part timers. Now they're going back to being school principals and accountants. Lawyers. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they ain't, got I mean that, really, they ain't, they ain't think about football right now. These part timers. Well, well, Hey, but what is hey, it, what is it really going to do yeah, okay. if you're sitting there? If hey, you're sitting what, there really watching what? film, if you're sitting there watching film all day long, okay. five, six okay. days a week, it's hey, still listen, 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 fast listen, and you listen. see something, you're right, going right. to make the call. Yeah. Okay. Okay. By that logic, by that logic, hey, why doesn't Joe Burrow, you know, you know, you don't need all these practice days. You don't need all this film watching Joe. Just watch film that couple times a week. And be fine. Do something else. Yeah, you don't need to come in. You don't need to devote all this time to your craft to perfect it. Hey, you think you think Joe Burrow just kind of rolls out of bed, and knows how to read a defense? You know why he knows that? Because he studied it. Because he thinks but about look, it all the time. Same with Patrick Mahomes. I'm sure these referees are watching film every night. You know, but unless they are watching real life full no. speed action five days a week, it's not going to make them better. On what they're seeing, the quick hey, lightning Mike. reaction. That's why they need a sky judge um, to help confirm uh, some of these calls. The school principals right now are thinking about enrollment and recruiting for the 2023-24 school year. <laughs> they ain't thinking about watching film. All right, no, all right, listen. Let me ask you this real quick. I know, I know. In Kansas City, you got all caught up uh, in, in the in the environment at Arrowhead, so you probably think the Chiefs are Super Bowl favorites. Got excited about Mahomes. I think Philadelphia is a slight favorite. They shouldn't be. They should be a dominant favorite. I think Philadelphia is going to handle Kansas City in the Super Bowl. What say you? I think their defense is what's going to give them a chance. I'm not so sure about Jalen Hurts. He didn't have to throw a whole lot. Also, they have not been tested this entire postseason. You blow out the Giants and you, you know, blow out the the 49ers without Brock Purdy. Um, so. I wonder if they're going to be able to handle this thing. I do wonder about the Chiefs defense being able to defend Jalen Hurts in the running game. I'm not sure if they're built for that, but I do not bet against Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, but you know, you said they haven't been tested. I mean, they have played Mike uh, uh, Philadelphia played the greatest team in modern football history on Sunday. I mean, the best coach ever uh, better than Lombardi better than Belichick. Uh, they got so much talent. San Francisco, they're just blessed with talent. They're so good. Oh, their roster is so loaded. So they were tested. I mean, like, wow. Well, I mean, wow, San Francisco, they do everything. They got everything you could possibly want. Who needs a quarterback? They're so good. They're the only NFL team that even need a quarterback. They're so well coached. Josh so Johnson. Hey, you know, a lot different between Josh okay. Johnson and Patrick Mahomes. I'm so glad they're going home. I'm glad San Francisco's at home. Go home. Go home. Watch Super Bowl. Watch Philadelphia win. Mike Jones, appreciate you, brother. Good to see you. I'll see you, man. They're so great. Get those officials. Get them some full-time jobs, man. Full-time. Hey, thank you for watching Brother From Another. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, go ahead and do that now. Don't forget, you can catch us three to four weekdays on PeacockTV.com and on Sirius XM Channel 85.